Till nästa gång. Volta med everyone to this webinar on turbine effect cascading disaster and lessons learned from Tonga eruption and tsunami. The natural hazard often occurs simultaneously or successively, resulting in complex compounding and cascading impact that interact each other. A system-based thinking is thus fundamental to understand the dynamics of this complex impact and as well as their point of interaction. Climate change may increase both compounding and cascading hazard in the future, as the knowledge on how this impacts interface is crucial for our disaster risk reduction. Duncan and Taylor, in partnership with Integrated Research on Disaster Risk, IRDR, the core data of International Science Council, bring together experts today to sharing about the systemic risk assessment, understand actually what really happened on this complex event that happened in Tonga, understand how actually the volcanic risk and science in the early warning system, and as well as the tsunami early warning systems and risk assessment, and overall actually where we should actually go forward in our global science research. So we have together with us today, myself, Bakun Fakhruddin, uh, I work as a technical director for Tonkin and Taylor, as well as chair for Kodata Task Group on Fair Data for Disaster Risk Reduction. We have with us Anna Aki from Tonga, who is a disaster risk reduction expert based in Tonga. We have a, our volcanic risk, risk expert, Professor Shane Cronin from the University of Auckland, as well as our tsunami expert, Aditya Guzman from GNS Science. Uh, we have also uh, Professor John Hentfel from the um, joining with us to discuss about more about the, what are the global uh, science will be leading us in the future. So with these things, uh, let's welcome everyone again. Um, thank you so much for joining with us. Uh, in the meantime, you may able to see a poll on the right side uh, just to let us know where you are actually joining today, which continent are you based in. Uh, we are just overwhelmed to see actually more than 360 people actually register. Whoever actually in the different time zone, they'll be able to get a copy of the recorded question so that they can actually listen to once a yeah, suitable time switch you. With these things, I may like to start with our first speaker, which is myself, as mentioned that um, I'll be just giving an overview of uh, the systemic um, risk as cascading and compounding impact. As you can see, the new year actually provided quite uh, the ideal example of the complex compounding and cascading disaster in Tonga. My colleague Anna will be more discuss about what happened and how it happened. But as you can see, that a cyclone risk bringing a important eruption, which caused a tsunami and create a havoc into the overall disaster management system into the Tonga. And in generally, as you can see, that a volcanic eruption would create a tsunami and ash fault and then it's quite a cascading with the flood from the tsunami as well as risk of infrastructure collapse and health issue as well as water pollution from the ash fall. And then it creates some more complexity, bringing a pandemic into the, into the society, bringing stress on social and government, overall government system. And overall, it actually creates a quite complex uh, impact into the, into the overall emergency response, loss of lives, loss of crops, housing infrastructure damage, critical infrastructure damage, and um, overall actually creates an overall economic loss around 90.4 million US dollar. So the complex impact shows how critical uh, the system interdependency amplified by underlying vulnerabilities. And there is a growing need to better understand this kind of cascading impact and systemic risk and possible political and social societal response uh, to ensure the post-disaster recovery as well as our effective recovery. The, if we just try to look at the, our, the, the key attributes from a systemic risk or uh, complex for a complex impact or systemic risk for a com complex component cascading impact, when traditionally we try to look at a system for a single hazard, which mostly attributes with four dimensional, even though that was quite overwhelming for any kind of disaster risk reduction perspective, when trying to look at 
from present to the future in terms of 100 years up to century, hour to century, we try to look at your know, hazard exposure and vulnerabilities. At the same time, we're looking at the global to the local scale, and then how that actually creating an impact to the overall societal or overall actually sectoral aspect in terms of infrastructure, economics, um, um, political environment, as well as human damage. And looking at more when it's actually coming to more domino effect or more on cascading and compounding effect, the key attributes of systemic risk could be more multidimensional. Uh, it, it could be, now look at more, uh, I just put actually six dimension. There has been a nice uh, literature review has been done for looking at more on five dimension terms, where actually you're trying to look at your temporal and spatial scale, but at the same time you're trying to look at actually the understanding your system. So what are actually your unknown, what are your actually knowledge, how actually they are actually amplifies, how actually this underestimated or how actually it actually trying to do um, creating systemic impact. And then there are actually a lot of transboundary effects, looking at the cascading effect, looking at the uh, compounding effect, looking at interrelationship with the event, how actually this ripple and spider it together. And then on the relationship aspect, you need to look at actually how are each of those attributes are interdependent, how actually you create feedback loop, what are the interaction, what are the interlinkage, what are the interconnection, and what are the um, interwinded, and then how actually create an outcomes related result to the breakdown, to the collapse, or to the other consequences that it makes. So a systemic risk trend to be more actually attenuated rather than amplified uh, in the public perception uh, um, due to various reason as one of the reasons is um, our risk perception is still actually not being linearly uh, calibrated to the seriousness to understand the risk or seriousness to understand the hazard how it can create actually um, consequences into when it comes to the risk domain and system thinking in that perspective implies an embrace in complex and uncertainty and it needs to be look at more actually interconnection relationship that recognize the value, the vulnerabilities, as well as social justice. So ending with my talk, for to be compelling, uh, the, we need to understand these things quite collaboratively. We need to design the systems more co-productive, co-creation and people-centered early warning systems so that it makes a need-based system rather than top-down systems so that Darling, um, so that it could consider a collaborative environment into the anticipatory of critical biophysical as, as well as socioeconomic threshold. And the recent ex extreme weather event already actually provided some critical examples of how actually crossing the threshold, and as well as a great evidence has been published two weeks back by the IPCC. It shows that uh, how actually our future is look like, what kind of actually uh, enormous impact it could create if we don't actually take action at this moment right now, or how actually the solar strategy would be a new norms for the future. So in this regard, um, we need to actually look things quite seriously and quite um, systematically so that we understand that how the system works and how it could create the consequences into the future risk reduction. With these things, I'd like to probably invite uh, my extreme colleague, Anna Aki, who is a disaster risk expert <coughs> in Tonga, to a little bit talk about what really happened in Tonga and how actually they try to respond to this kind of complex and cascading disaster into their area. And over to you. Uh, you can mute, you need to turn on your camera and Hello? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Carry on, Anna. Um, thank you, Bafan and the organizers, for organizing the webinar, um, enabling me to participate and give voice to the thousands affected by the Hunga Tonga Hunga Hapa eruption on the 15th of January. Uh, to give it some context, we'd have to go back and look 
predict uh, the timeline and what happened leading up to the day of. On the 20th of December, shortly before Christmas, we had our fireworks from the volcano bringing it back from the dormant stage. However, the ash and cloud cover was not significant. So inter-island flights still operated, but the public was warned of ashfall that may contaminate water supplies, advising them to take down, uh, down pipes and gatherings until a later time. By Christmas, there was another set of eruptions, a little bit more significant than the one before. And this time the ash cloud drifted east, falling on the southern group of Papua by contaminating their water tanks. On the morning of the 14th of January, residents of Dongatapu and Hapai reported strong sense of sulfur in the air. The coastal residents reported strange tidal and seawater movement at the waterfront and beaches. A tsunami warning was issued later and cancelled while the Tonga Geology uh, Department monitored the activity. The National Emergency Management Committee met at 1 p.m. and activated the National Emergency Coordination Center with the district operation centers in the outer islands on standby. Hapai, uh, two islands in the Hapai group, Fonoi and Mango, reported bulk ash compromising their water supply and had asked for drinking water from the main island. So Nemo and His Majesty's Armed Forces organized a immediate response to deliver drinking water to those two islands, which was delivered on the morning of Saturday at 8 a.m. Uh, because it was a Saturday morning, people went about their business uh, as usual, going shopping, usually Sundays, uh, everything here is closed. So everyone comes to the markets uh, to sell or to shop and in the afternoons, uh, some people were out having a picnic at the beaches. At approximately 5.20 on Saturday afternoon, uh, the blast was heard all across Tonadapu and it was deafening. Sirens that uh, have already been installed did not ring due to the immediate nature of the disaster. The people relied mainly on their instinct and common sense, telling them to run to high ground, learning from past experiences through tsunami drills, watching videos on Japanese experience and the tsunami warning of the day before. So people ran or drove to safety away from the coast. Police and emergency responders were, res were dispatched to the waterfront of Nukalofa, warning residents to move inland immediately. Those on the outer islands uh, relied on their own instinct. People evacuated in panic, and caused major traffic jams along the roads. Soon after the mushroom cloud covered the skies before it darkened, pumice fell from the sky, followed by looming ash, obliviating any light. Ash fell and blanketed Tongata Papa in Ewa. It affected our electrical plants and it shut down our main power lines before 7 p.m. On Sunday morning, Nemo uh, conducted the immediate disaster assessment and found that pe three people from the outer island of Papai had died. The asphalt had impacted the three island groups of Tongatapu, Ewa, and um, Papai. 84,000 people were affected. More than 3,000 people were displaced. They were either in evacuation centers or park cars on roadsides seeking shelter on anything that was deemed high ground. 33 homes were completely destroyed, 117 severely damaged, and 74 moderately damaged. The wharf in uh, the outer island of Ewa was completely damaged. Mango was completely destroyed. Um, so were other resorts, um, uh, Fafa and Baranmotu. And communication, uh, there was a communication blackout. We couldn't communicate to the outer islands or overseas. Internet was down because of the volcanic eruption. The satellite imagery assessment came from outside of Tonga with the help of Harpon and his team at the Volunteer Rapid 
Disaster Monitoring and Mapping Initiative. Cortana offering the first set of online imagery together with UNICEF. This allows for logistical coherence and timely deployment of resources and humanitarian aid to the most vulnerable of settlements by collaborating with relevant line ministries, emergency agencies, as well as frontliners and NGOs, church groups, um, but most importantly, those on the ground who were the town officers, the district officers, government representatives, and the local village groups. Uh, those images and maps helped with the rapid assessment carried out by the World Bank, which also helped the government informing them of their damage and recovery plans. Without the collaborated efforts and uh, help that we see from our international partners and colleagues such as Bakwan and Tonga and Taylor, their networks, Tonga would have been in the dark more about the extent of the damages to the outer islands due to the communication blackout. Fortunately, internet via satellite through the High Commissions and ADB, they were still a lifeline to the outside world through very limited capacity. Even now, the working relationship between the Tongan government and Tonga and Taylor is continuing through the help of other regional partners with the hopes of strengthening Thomas frontliners and emergency management services. We would like to acknowledge our continued partnership and hope that you continue to support us in the future. Malawi. Thank you so much, Anna. And we really, um, our deepest condolence to people actually who lost their life. And our also uh, sympathy and we are together actually to help the country as well as the community who are actually still suffering for uh, various emergency response as well as recovery phase. So we are here with you, we are together. Now I would like to invite our next speaker, Professor Shen Konin, who is actually right now based in Tonga, uh, doing his research work on this uh, extensive and extraordinary research on volcano tsunami. Over to you, Professor Shen. Malo Lele, um, it's uh, nice to speak to you all from Tonga. Um, uh, so I am going to be uh, helping the Tongan Geosciences Services to understand the, the uh, nature of this eruption and also to try to put together some uh, ideas on how we can improve uh, monitoring and warning for such uh, eruptions, not only from this volcano, but from others in the future. And uh, so the, uh, the Honga volcano provides a really difficult situation for us in, all, uh, in terms of providing forecasting and warning because it is located uh, around 65 kilometers from Tongatapu and even just slightly further to other islands in, in the Hapai group. And so it is also mostly underwater and uh, those pieces of land that are above water are changing all the time. It is a caldera volcano, and there are several of these in the Tongan arc. There are also um, these submarine volcanoes are quite steep, and they have many landslide events. So there's not only the volcanic activity, but also related landslide activity, which can also generate tsunami. And there are many eruptions that have taken place in the historic times that have been relatively short-lived and small with local impacts. And so uh, these are mainly occurring around the edge of the volcano. The, uh, the sequence that began on about the 19th and the 20th of December uh, has modified and changed the uh, volcano landscape. So this is the picture before uh, the eruption, and this is just the northern half of the caldera. And a series of eruptions throughout December uh, looked very similar to activity that was occurring in the past historic eruptions. And so the models for the activity were that it would stay a relatively low level event with impacts and hazards close to the volcano. Unfortunately, the large scale eruption on the 15th was so much larger than anything we have seen before that it has caused a large change, not only in the in the local landscape. Uh, this is the picture now. The uh, the Hunga volcano has only these two small pieces, um, and part of the 
the submarine collapse and the submarine caldera was the reason for such dramatic and violent events, including tsunami and air pressure waves. And so this was um, based on the height of the eruption plume and the spread of the eruption plume, one of the most explosive eruptions recorded at any place at any time in the world on modern satellites. So it was a very large event. Our understanding of the event, however, is quite poor because the uh, information that we have so far on the ash uh, distribution is limited to only a few sites. And so part of the work I'll be doing here will be helping the Tongan Geosciences team understand the scope of this eruption and to better inform models of ash dispersal. So this USGS model of ash dispersal is more or less a complete guess based on some uh, parameters that we, we think are most likely and most logical, and that we really need to get further information on this. So um, the tools that uh, the Tongan Geosciences uh, Services has available uh, to provide warnings are information from past events, which as I say, are dominated by historic eruptions and relatively small ones, information from satellite um, uh, data and also uh, information from direct observation. And in this case, the direct observations are sporadic, expensive, and dangerous. And I would like to point out this lower picture with the team standing there less than 24 hours before the very large eruption. There are no seismic information. There is no other real-time data. The satellite data is very good, has lots of different aspects to it. Gas can be measured. Uh, eruptions can be measured and so on, but it is too late for forecasting, at least with our current knowledge base of, of scenarios in this, in this area. So we also have potential for using some uh, new ideas and new technologies for monitoring these volcanoes. They're quite difficult to monitor. This is a picture of some of the submarine cables that were damaged by the event because there were submarine landslides. Um, when these cables are repaired, they do have a potential also for being part of a monitoring solution with new technologies. Now, this has been talked about, but nothing has been actioned yet. And when we think of other backbone infrastructure, like USGS Global Models of Seismicity, these are poor in resolution and poor in the size detection limit to understand what's going on prior to eruptions. And so there are a few earthquakes that occurred prior to this event, but they were a, a part of a normal pattern. And the earthquake detections actually were more common after the eruption, and, uh, and mainly because the threshold of detection is, is too high to see what is happening. So if we take these uh, observations together, then these are some of the constraints that we have. There are a harsh physical environment, so it's difficult to actually put and maintain monitoring equipment on the volcano. Um, there is a potential to improve monitoring by adding uh, sensors in <coughs> Tongatapu and Hapai, but this needs long-term commitment. There is also obviously continued development of satellite and methods, but they still won't provide us with the advanced warning. So really what we need is a combination of better understanding of the volcanoes and the eruption hazards and building some better scenarios from these. Also major investment in people in Tonga, training, upskilling, tertiary qualifications and experience in observations uh, in other parts of the world so that uh, we can then have better uh, advance warning of bigger events that are going on. And I guess the last point I want to make is to recognize that Hunga is just one of at least 12 and possibly more um, subaerial and, and submarine volcanoes that have the potential to produce large hazardous eruptions. And my past work in Tonga has shown that there have been at least 25 very large eruptions that have produced volcanic ash on inhabited areas uh, up to one, up to a half a meter thick um, volcanic ash on 25 occasions over the last around 6,000 years. So a frequent and potentially 
ongoing hazard for the region. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shane. I think this this complex event actually gave us an opportunity, especially on the science domain, actually to rethink and rebuild actually how we can actually understand this volcanic or landslip related tsunami. And hopefully that some of this recent event would allow us to better understand and better predict those in the future. Now I would like to invite my colleague Aditya Guzman from GNS Science to a little bit talk about the tsunami modeling that they made. Uh, right after the tsunami event in, in Tonga. What do you want to say? Thank you, Vapon, for inviting me to give a talk in this, uh, in this event. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, the tsunami early warning system around the world. Uh, were not fully prepared to respond to uh, a, a typical tsunami like the one produced by the Honga Tonga Honga Hapai explosive uh, eruption. Um, without a better understanding of the complexity of tsunami generation and propagation of this kind is very important to uh, help improve future tsunami disaster mitigation. Our focus of uh, our study here is to increase our limited understanding of tsunami generation by the air wave. Uh, so I um, think you everybody here already know where the volcano was. Uh, I want to use this map over here to show you that the underwater volcano was located near Tonga Trench. This trench is a deep thematic feature that significantly affect the tsunami propagation. Um, there are at least eight known vulcan volcanic tsunami source mechanism. Uh, here are uh, five uh, pictures uh, or illustration of those uh, mechanism. This is the like under underwater explosion. Uh, this might happen during the event. And here's um, illustration for uh, air wave after the explosion so we here uh, when i will discuss uh, uh, about this kind of mechanism the mechanism of tsunami generation by air wave and uh, we know uh, volcanic eruption can produce uh, sub aerial or submarine failures and pyrocaustic flow and also caldera collapse uh, the tsunami from the uh, Tonga volcano, volcanic eruption could have been generated by any of the, or a combination of this mechanism. Um, but again, the focus of this study is just, uh, we are going to, I'm going to present you this, our uh, result of studying uh, air wave tsunami. So we have a new DART network that was designed to enhance tsunami forecasting capability in New Zealand and Southwestern Pacific region. The DART system includes a bottom pressure recorder that was designed to measure tsunami in deep ocean. The DART record uh, records the combined pressure change uh, from the atmospheric pressure changes and also pressure change due to uh, passage of uh, water waves. So we found uh, using, I mean, after um, uh, processing the, the DART data, we found that the tsunami was unusually fast and large, particularly in large distance from the source. Here are plots of uh, tsunami waveform at <laughs> DART station um, in Southwest Pacific. We have 10 DART here around the, uh, in the Southwest Pacific and here uh, triangles show other DART uh, installed in other subduction zones. So to study the uh, air wave uh, tsunami, we first use uh, air pressure observation uh, at weather station. We use 94 weather station located uh, between 600 to 4,000 kilometers from the volcano. The data were provided by MedSurface. So here, uh, black traces are the uh, the waveform for the um, air pressure. So we pick the amplitude 
and then we plot it against the distance from the volcano uh, using the peak amplitude and trough we can see that the air wave amplitude decays proportionally to one over square root of distance and then uh, here is a plot of arrival time against the, the distance arrival time of the peak uh, amplitude so if we plot here and then do regression analysis we found that the estimated wave speed is about 317 meter per second and the effective origin time of this peak uh, amplitude is at 429 UTC so we use this parameter to uh, make a air wave model and here's our animation for the air wave model for an on the upper panel is the animation for the air wave. The source of air wave is modeled to be isotropic. Uh, so the wave is assumed to propagate in the same way in all directions with constant speed. Uh, here in the lower panel is the excited uh, tsunami wave. Um, the, we can see the leading wave here uh, recorded by uh, ocean uh, ocean pressure gauge can be reproduced by the model. Uh, here, uh, the the leading wave is actually a superposition of the uh, direct effect from air pressure wave and then the tsunami excited by the air pressure wave. So the so this is the we can see the speed of the leading wave here. This is oceanic wave. The speed is actually the same as the uh, air wave, but the the i mean the wave uh, after the leading wave is just propagating uh, with the speed of a normal or normal tsunami uh yeah so this the black line is the the data and red is the simulated waveform um we also identified signal in later wave here the large signal which was not um uh, reproduced by the model so this uh, we then identified that this uh, wave in the later phase may be generated by water displacement at the volcano. So, in other words, it's from another mechanism, not uh, not uh, not the air wave mechanism. Could be like landslide or explosion, which is localized at the volcano, while air wave uh, generating the tsunami continuously as it uh, travel. And here's just. Uh, also similar plots, but with larger uh, modeling domain. And here's uh, plots of the uh, waveform at uh, other dark stations around the Pacific Ocean. Again, here um, we can we can see the simulation. Uh, we, the simulation show how the tsunami was generated by the air wave in Caribbean, which is separated. Um, which is separated from the Pacific Ocean by the Central America landmass. This feature is quite unique to it's is unique to air wave source as a, the tsunami generated by localized localized mechanism such as earthquake or landslide at the volcano would be blocked by this landmass. Here's another animation, um, where this time it's uh, around the globe. So unlike you can imagine, unlike air wave generated tsunami, a regular localized, uh, I mean, locally generated tsunami will need to propagate around, around the land masses to reach other ocean. But uh, this one, I mean, uh, the the it it the land masses will not block the the air wave, so the the tsunami will also not be blocked by the land masses. And how to uh, forecast the tsunami? So from this kind, so as uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, tsunami early warning around the world were not fully prepared to respond to this kind of tsunami, and we don't have pre-computed simulation uh, ready for air wave tsunami event. But maybe we can use uh, initial leading wave uh, excited by the air wave as a precursor of incoming larger wave. So this is uh, these are plots of uh, air wave uh, at coastal gauges in New Zealand, like Kispon, Chatham, Castle Point. So this is small, like five hectopascal or uh, uh, equivalent to five centimeter of sea level. So it's very small here. Uh, this this one is this one is at uh, barometer and this one is at tight gauges. Uh, 
So the amplitude here is small. Uh, you can see the amplitude of uh, leading wave is small, but the uh, incoming wave, I mean, the later wave is larger. So the, the small leading wave may be, uh, can be used as precursor to, uh, to warn us of an incoming larger wave. So that's uh, our talk. This is uh, just a summary of the talk. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you so much um, for your talk. And it, it shows actually how complex the situation is. And how is quite a continuous eruption could create a sonic e effect, which started in Tonga. And you see that uh, the impact is actually in Peru or South America. So now I would like to invite our last but not least, uh, Professor John Hansberg from International Institute of Applied System Analytics. <coughs> he was also the chair for IRTR and lead the, how the global activity research should be look like in some of these emerging events that are happening in the world. So welcome, Professor John Hansberg, over to you. Thanks, uh, Bapon, and th <clears throat> thanks to everyone who's been involved in organizing this meeting and uh, speaking, and of course, all the participants. Uh, I know some are joining from places where the uh, time zone makes it a pretty difficult time. Bapon's asked me to uh, make a comment on the application, or this is how I interpret it, the application of the, the new, uh, this new framework for global risk science, it should read, or, or it's in the form of a research agenda, how that might apply to situations such as uh, the Tonga uh, volcano or other such complex crises. Um, just very, very briefly, because I'm conscious that we are running out of time. Um, we are conscious, all of us, I think, and aware that there are, uh, does the disaster risk landscape appears to be uh, becoming a lot more challenging. Um, <clears throat> people often talk about unimaginable disasters. Uh, and all this is in the context, of course, of COVID. And uh, to, to many people, a world that's seemingly now in perpetual crisis. So the International Science Council, the UN Disaster Risk Reduction Office and the IRDR sponsored the development of this framework over the last couple of years. Uh, it started pre-COVID, finished last year. <clears throat> so um, I guess to sort of put it in a nutshell, um, we came to the view um, with a very broad ranging um, iterative consultations that uh, disaster risk reduction and its supporting science and the evidence base would need to would need to change, would need to be reimagined to, for a start, explicitly encompass climate change, which I think has happened, is happening, and the sustainable development goals with their um, direct connection with vulnerabilities, which are a critical part of any risk assessment. It needs to change how it does business as well, especially in the case here, I'm talking from the science point of view. Um, the uh, report contained nine research priorities. These are, these are um, more for dis as discussion starters. They're not prescriptive. Um, with some cross-cutting themes. Now, many of these are things that uh, have already been raised and we've heard quite a bit about the complexity of this, uh, this event. And that is the, very much a, a focus, uh, one of the foci of this, uh, of this report or of this research framework. And traditional risk assessments would uh, focus quite reasonably on understanding the volcanic hazard gaining a greater, under, and now today, gaining a much greater and better understanding of the complexity of this events and the, and the cascading impacts. Um, some attention would also go to understanding vulnerabilities. And as I said, these are explicitly part of the, the, new, um, the new research agenda, including um, the, the, the reality that as we uh, get to know more about a, a particular hazard or, or issue, such as undersea volcanoes, our understanding changes and we and our identification of what the gaps are in our knowledge also evolves. <clears throat> the risk assessments um, have often involved and should involve multiple disciplines, but we're arguing in this report for a lot more. We're arguing for a, a truly transdisciplinary approach 
which is it's a cross-cutting theme of, of the whole document. Um, uh, we could say, look, we've had uh, this argument a lot. Uh, yes, uh, it's great to, for disciplines to work together. But um, here we are referring to a lot more than simply lowering disciplinary boundaries, um, we, which is important and critical to sound risk analyses. Otherwise, we're just looking at a, a particular aspects of, of the risk. Um, a transdisciplinary approach in this context demands the inclusion of sources and knowledge from outside traditional science, um, including knowledge derived from experience and practice, and, and in many cases, traditional and indigenous knowledge. So we, we might think, well, how would this apply potentially to a risk assessment or, or a warning system, perhaps in the Pacific? Well, we need to understand the complexities of what the ha of the hazard. But this is an on this, of course, is an ongoing. This is a journey. We're not going to suddenly say, "Oh, we've solved all the problems to do with with the hazard." Um, and it's a critical part of our understanding and and of putting together a, a useful and effective risk assessment. But integral to this sort of risk assessment uh, is knowledge of the needs and priorities of local communities because they are the, they are the people uh, that the assessments have been done for or about, and uh, the inclusion of their, their knowledge on volcano tsunamis and how the threats are best managed. So it's, it's calling for a co-design, I think Papon mentioned this. <clears throat> it's absolutely calling for, for a, a more of a co-design approach or a, a co-development of, of the risk knowledge. Um, for this to happen, um, science and scientists need to change. Uh, many are, but uh, we need to get a lot more efforts needed. There's no question. And one of the positive sides of this is that it's up to us as scientists and scientific organisations to drive change of this sort. Um, it's not we don't have to wait for government funding to take the lead or anything. The usual reasons for not being able to change. We, we are, it's in our own hands. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, for your insight on how the global science should be looked like. Um, now we'd like to open the floor for question and answer. I can see there is a question from Andrew Tapper regarding a question to Shane. Um, about the observation system for submarine volcanoes and how it could be sustainable and resource. And I think, unfortunately, we actually lost Sean Shen, but I could just leave it, reflect on these things again, Andrew. Um, I think that the project that you lead in Tonga for multi hazard early warning systems, that has actually quite designed well how actually we monitor the seismicity, the volcanic eruption, as well as earthquake monitoring system. But the challenge would be for a country like uh, Tonga or any other developing country, how actually we resource to maintaining those kind of expensive equipment and continuously monitoring and allowing the data depository as well as centralized data mechanism. That is actually quite challenging and we need to have a quite collective solution on that. At the same time, also, I think there are actually a lot of uh, collaboration and coordination mechanism need at the regional level as well as on the global level that how actually the volcanic um, you know, volcanic uh, field or expedition people or organization collaborate with the disaster risk reduction as well as uh, how those other agencies actually uh, interoperable as well as participate together on a common goal common thing probably uh, that's able to answer your question Andrew. We have one more uh, question to for Aditya. So given the close proximity of population center communities to the volcanic and by extension the tsunami hazard, it seems that fully engagement of communities in the preparedness and response is the key. Uh, what is being done is that in that regards and how much and what is being done in terms of raising awareness and engaging communities living in the ongoing hazard. So it's more about the community preparedness aspect. Um, Aditya or Anna, do you like to respond to it? I can also have to compliment. 
Probably I can, I can just yeah. a little bit add here. So one of the one of the interesting things if you just look at this particular complex event, the, the casualty for such kind of large event is actually quite minimal, I would say. Mm. And one of the reasons for this is you know the culture, the context, as well there's there's indigenous knowledge that they brought to a family. As a Tongan or Pacifica, they actually quite strongly bonded and uh, closely follow their indigenous as well as heritage knowledge. And I think that helps them to uh, better prepare, better response in this particular case. But also our hearts goes to those actually who lost their lives and who actually suffered a lot during this kind of um, event, because obviously you cannot save those infrastructure due to the poor infrastructure condition and poor design. Uh, and people have to suffer, still suffer at the end of the day. But uh, med service as well as uh, Tonga Geo has it. They actually try to do a continuous capacity building and awareness program, but that may be mostly followed by earthquake genic or earthquake generated tsunami, uh, volcanic or undersea landslide related tsunami is rare, and that may be what we need to be also incorporate into our SOP as well as into the awareness and capacity building activities. All right, so we have some more questions here. Uh, so panel member, anyone can take on this one, which is uh, with the climate change uh, dominating the agenda in the Pacific, how attention to be brought back to the other relevant hazards such as volcanic eruption. So it's just more actually how we actually link up with the climate change and geohazard. Um, with the same coherence manner. John, do you like to respond to it? Oh, quickly, um, I'm conscious that time seems to be evaporating. Um, there's a couple of ways of looking at this. Uh, we would call for a lot more uh, collaboration across the sciences. So in that sense, uh, those, in, those in the climate area would work a bit more closely, not necessarily totally, but with our colleagues in the volcanic and other areas um, to, to get a better feel for the, the hazard and how this might propagate in terms of the impacts and um, people infrastructure. Um, in terms of uh, community and community organization preparedness, uh, this is not necessarily so different for um, different hazards, So, uh, which is a good thing, uh, but I would argue that people probably need to communities need to discuss these differences um, and be aware that good preparation for say uh, a cyclone will also be helpful in a, a tsunami but there are differences in fact they have to people have to move from low ground but they do for a cyclone as well so i think that um, it, there are differences and they are one level dramatic but in another way we can harness them through collaboration and discussion to to get a very good synergistic result. Yeah. Thanks, John. Um, as time is ticking, we will be closing that another two minutes time. But just a couple of questions that came out that whether there is any kind of global assessment has been done for this event. I think there are actually several assessment is undergoing or actually on the, their initial state. We saw a couple of those research papers actually from the Chinese Academy of Science, they presented on the last week with us. Um, there has been some study by USGS and others. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to collectively share if you, you know, anyone has any interest. Uh, one more question regarding um, to John or uh, uh, to the panel that some of those global research agenda that has been brought, how actually that could be applied for Tonga, or is there any kind of actually has been applied to, you know, to that? I can just maybe respond to this. Uh, the, the Tonga has a still actually a project is ongoing a multi-hazard early warning systems under the PEP project with uh, support from the uh, World Bank. Uh, and a quite robust multi-hazard early warning system design has been completed, but unfortunately many of those components not yet implemented or operationalized in the field. Uh, so if the government puts some priority, I hope that Tonga would be one of the best country in the Pacific who can demonstrate a more multi-hazard environment, how actually they could demonstrate their a more enhancement into the multi-hazard 
early warning as well as emergency response um, capabilities. So with these things, um, maybe I'd just like to conclude here. And if you have any more questions, feel free to click here. We can obviously respond to you by email. Uh, I'm also typing my uh, email address. Feel free to send me an email uh, anytime. We'll be able to respond to your questions. Right. And then I think I think um, this this is event actually again as I mentioned that it's provided quite good lessons for all the science community as well as the response community that how we have to better prepared for some of those cascading and compounding uh, disaster impact and how actually we need to look at you know, disaster in a systemic way. And in that regards, it's now actually up to us uh, to embark on a visionary rethink and redesign our feature by engaging our community or co-design and co-production of it. And we have a once in a lifetime uh, opportunity to reimagine as well as to rebuild a resilience world. So it's wondering this may actually bring some unlikely consequences and there has been always so many evidence on that so in this regards i'd like to thank everyone for joining with us today um, we normally offer um, a similar kind of session once in every three months so keep keep looking at our website or keep connected with us we'll be happy to share with you some more thoughts or insight on how the science could be bring into society or how the emerging science could be a successful aspect in a system as well as coherence way. With this, thank you so much again. Thanks all the panel members, thanks all the audience, thanks everyone, and thanks to all the music.